Welcome to the only class at Westminster where our stated objective is the pursuit of happiness. That's right, we're about to embark on a journey into the ancient world to uncover the secrets of human flourishing. I hope by the end of this course not only to convince you that pursuing your own happiness is good, I hope you will see that it is in fact honoring the Lord. I hope you will have a little better sense of how to go about it. Hold on, let's get happy. First, serve. Which of these pictures represents happiness? I'm not tricky. I'm not going to assign you a personality number profile and tell you which line of work you need to enter and who you should marry. I just want you thinking honestly about your first reaction. Now, pick one, analyze it, take 60 seconds, and tell me why you chose the picture. Ready? Set. Go. Those pens and pencils moving. Point here is to keep the mind active. Keep writing. Dig into the deep recesses of your soul. that entire 60 seconds thank you hope your brains are uh, warmed up and firing on all cylinders so that you can really think deeply about this idea of happiness now of course happiness is a huge word and in, in a very real sense the term could have been applied to all three pictures okay um, I call it an umbrella term because it takes so much in it's mental spiritual physical could be active it could be passive you know we could see the CEO at the height of his career and say that guy's happy or we could see the woman sitting by the waterfall in complete nirvana and bliss you know meditating and lost to the world being like well that's happy too so which one is it you know so it's a huge word my goal in this unit is going to be to, to narrow it down a little bit to understand the ins and outs but before we do i want to face something that we're all going to have to like probably cross in the back of our, it's probably already going on in the back of your mind um, it's the fact that the word happiness is kind of a bad word in the christian subculture this quote from Oswald Chambers, happiness, I mean, to holiness, not happiness, is the chief end of man. Well, it's a common trope in Christian preaching. It sounds so good to be up there seriously, you know, facing the congregation and saying, happiness, that's what the world seeks. If you seek worldly happiness, you know, you have no place with God. Well, I just think it's wrong, y'all. I think it's a misconception of happiness and a misconception of God's uh, desire for us. I think ultimately, when we're happy, we're going to honor God most of all. So, sorry Mr. Chambers, all due respect though. This guy did a lot of good for a lot of people. I do want you to face a, a difficult question though here. Happiness. Could you have it here? Imagine a Christian missionary stuck in a prison cell in some closed country with no access to friends or family and living under the daily threat of torture or worse. Is there really any way? This guy or woman could be happy. You're stuck here, here, day after day. Are you going to be happy? Some of you are thinking, well, no, but I could have joy. Fine. I want you to take another 60 seconds here. Again, kind of just warming things up. I want you to answer, could a person be happy here? And if you said no, it's be I think a person couldn't be happy, but they would have joy. Explain to me what you mean there. Try your best to get down to the bottom of it. Again, take 60 seconds and enjoy some musical accompaniment.
seconds. Keep that, keep that pen or pencil moving. Okay, so let's get going here. So now you've, you've really thought some things through. Uh, could a person be happy in that prison cell? Um, my answer <laughs> is going to be both no and yes. Isn't that profound when I say that? We'll talk more about it later. Um, as you're gonna see, I, I'm gonna understand happiness in a way that a prison cell would make it pretty hard to fully live out what I would consider human happiness. However, I will say, even in the prison cell, the right kind of person can experience a large measure of what I would call human happiness. More on that later. Let's start talking about means and ends. What we're doing here is kind of getting into the Aristotelian definition of happiness. So everything I'm giving you here is from a book called Nicomachean Ethics. And it's the first place we're going to start with understanding uh, what, how the ancients thought about this concept of happiness and how we might learn from it. So first of all, let's work on distinguishing these two terms, means, ends. What's the difference here? Take a look at these three pictures. Can you distinguish the means and the end? Two pictures here are supposed to be pictures of means, and one of them is the end. Now you probably figured out pretty quickly that the house is the end, right? The construction worker, and the bulldozer are those are both means right of building a house both those activities are taking place with a view to ending up with this this beautiful comfortable home right so now you probably already noticed that the two pictures of means are pictures of activities being done by people with certain skills but the house is not what we'd call an activity right it's a product it's the result of an activity you know, if the if the bill if the construction worker and the bulldozer operator if they all do their jobs well, we we'll end up kind of with a house. Now, which brings me to my next idea. There's, there's actually lots of skills that go into making a house. Now, Aristotle would call these arts. Okay, an art is some kind of activity with a set of rules and a purpose. Notice how all of these arts, these skills, they're really serving a higher end. They're all trying to do their particular job with excellence, okay? But really, they're all aiming at the same thing too, right? Now, the, the roofer wants to do the roofing well. He wants to seal off the, the house from water. And the electrician wants to provide power uh, to the house in a safe manner. And the plumber wants to make sure that water that goes into the sink drains out in a proper manner. Now, all of these actors are roughly equal contributors in the process, but can you think of an art or a skill that is in some sense superior to all of these? Can you think of one skill that is sort of over even these four that I'm looking at? Who is it that tells these skilled workers where to put the shingles, where to build a wall, where to where to put the wires, where to do the plumbing. Have you thought of it yet? Who is it that's over the whole thing? It's the architect. The architect is a sort of prince in this enterprise. The other skilled laborers are all taking their cues from the architect. She has told every worker where they're going to do what they're going to do. And they take their cues from that person, right? Whoever it is that drew all these intricate plans. Every skill has a purpose. Every skill can be done with excellence. But some skills are superior to others because they are, we might say, nearer to the final destination. So some skills, some arts, okay, are higher than others. And that would mean, of course, that the ends of those arts or skills are higher and more to be preferred. This might be a little bit of a challenge for you because, you know, this is a democracy. We don't want to say that the architect is superior to the carpenter. Keep in mind, I'm not talking about the worth or value or dignity of anybody here. I'm speaking kind of in terms of why things are even operating. 
Consider this, if you will. Uh, the carpenter needs a hammer to frame a house. Somewhere out there, there's a guy who makes hammers, right? Now, that guy's important. He makes hammers, right? But frankly, the hammer maker is serving the carpenter. The carpenter, in some sense, has the higher end here because the carpenter needs the hammer to do his job. Okay, but nobody really, you know, like nobody wants a hammer for its own sake. You know, like the thing we really want is a house, right? We don't want a hammer, we want a house, but we need the hammer to make the house. Well, can you see now that the architect is sort of using the carpenter and his skills of framing a house, and he's also using the electrician and the plumber? In other words, the skills of the electrician, plumber, and carpenter, those are all tools in the tool bag of the architect. Are they important? Sure. But, you know, there's something supreme and superior and kind of, um, like I said, it, uh, something kind of higher about the architect's craft because that architect is using all these other things as its uh, tools. Now, the, the question that Aristotle wants us to ask, what is the art of being human? Now, you, you know the carpenter wants to do his job well. He wants to you know frame those two by four so that they stand up strong and straight. And the, the plumber wants to provide a drainage system with no leakage. An electrician wants to provide you know, a way for the house to have power in every room without there being um, a trip breaker. And if they do all their jobs right and they, and they do exactly what the architect told them to do, where they told and he told them to do it and how he told them to do it, well, then you'll have a really great house in the end. And you'll be, there, there'll be some kind of like final success, right? What if we could talk about, so that was all about home building. But what if we could talk about being human? What would it be like? What would be, what would be the final outcome of the human life when it was done perfectly, when it was lived the way it was supposed to be lived? You know, this would be really the end of all ends. It would be why the architect is working. It would be why the musician is working. It would be why a military general is working. They're all working, right, for the sake of human life, so that human life can be lived to its fullest. So Aristotle says, if there is some end in things we do, which we desire for its own sake, clearly this must be the chief good. Knowing this will have a great influence on how we live our lives. Well, what is it then? What... If we could locate this one thing, if we could locate the thing that is our final destination of all our skill, of all our effort, of all our desire, well, wouldn't that be worth pursuing? I mean, wouldn't that be the thing that above everything else we'd want to know about? I mean, great, be a banker, be a lawyer, be a doctor, but all of those things, all of those skills, of course, would be serving this one final maximum superior end of living human life. And this is how Aristotle defines happiness, okay? He says, men generally agree that the highest good attainable by action is happiness and identify living well and doing well with happiness. And don't get worked up about this because it really hasn't said a lot yet. He's basically just said happiness is the end end, okay? We've talked about means and ends. What happens if you got to a place where there was no more to be accomplished. You had gotten everything done. It was the end of all ends. That's what he said. That's happiness. He hasn't said anything else about it. Okay. Now this is hard. I know sometimes to get your head around, but like, so imagine, you know, an annoying little kid and, you know, and you're, you're sitting there trying to do your homework or something. And the kid says, well, why are you doing that? And, and you know, why are you doing that? And it just keeps on just pounding you. Why, 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 why are you doing that? And you just say, oh, I'm writing this down to take a test. Why are you doing it? So I can get into college. So I can get a job, et cetera, et cetera. So why are you doing that? And you just keep answering. Every time you try to answer another why question, he throws it at you. At some point, you're going to stop, though. At some point, you'll be like, well, that's it. That's the last why question. And you'd say, well, because I want to be happy. That's what he means. Now, he hasn't defined it as an emotion, a pleasure, an activity, or state of mind. He's just said, when you're done with it all, when you're done with the desire, when you've reached the final end of human life, let's just call that happiness. All right? We don't have to commit to it being an emotion. We don't have to commit to it being um, a pleasure. We're just saying, whatever else you're doing, this is the reason you're doing it in the end. Happiness. Okay? One last thing, and then we'll be gone. You can have your spring break. Look at these pictures. 
Each of them has a purpose, right? Each of them was made to serve a particular function. And if you tried to use them in the wrong way, it could damage it, right? Violins, for example, don't work well at cutting through woods, wood. And while uh, saws are sometimes used in music, that's actually true, uh, you'd have a hard time getting any Mozart out of that thing. And neither the saw nor the violin would help you identify that strangely colored bird in the tree outside your window, right? So each of these things has a purpose, has an end. They were made to function a certain way. And if you know the purpose and the function for which they were made, you stand a really good chance of helping these things, these tools, to accomplish their purpose. In a sense, you're making each of them happy, right? You're taking them to that final place they were meant for. When a violin is being played by a virtuoso uh, and, is being, and is playing beautiful music, well, now the violin is doing all that it could ever want it to have done. And when a pair of binoculars are being used to see things at a distance and they're being used well, well, this is what they were made for, right? So each of these things can be used well and they can be used poorly. If you take the violin and you try to use it as a percussion instrument, Sure. I mean, it could get some cool sounds out of it. But it's not what it's made for, right? Now, what about the hand? What about the saw? What, use it as a self-defense weapon. I mean, it would work. You know, it, I'm not saying it couldn't happen, but it's not what it's meant for. If you start to use it to cut through wood, now you're going to see this is what the thing is made for. If you can know what a thing is made for, then you can help it reach its end end, as we said. And you can see the question this leaves us with. It what might we seem made. crazy what I'm about to if say. We can find out what we were made for. And we can start the project of fulfilling our happiness. Finding our purpose. Reaching our end. And experiencing whatever it is. Happiness. With the air, like I don't care, baby, by the way.